Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Jesse Proudman, uh, IBM Distinguished Engineer and CTO of what is now the Blue Mix Private Cloud product line. Uh, wanted to spend some time today setting the context of the IBM Cloud strategy and then how the Blue Mix Private Cloud product line fits into that. So I'll start uh, talking through that strategy and the handoff uh, to Asmir, who will talk through the, the Blue Mix Private Cloud product. So if we think about cloud technologies now, I mean, if we, we back up, 2006 was really the start of programmable infrastructure with, with the rise of Amazon Web Services. And at the beginning, it was really just a matter of infrastructure, of compute, networking, and storage. But over the last uh, decade, it, that story has changed, where uh, at this point in time, cloud really is a platform of, of composable services that is designed to make application development easier and faster and more efficient for, for engineers in your organization. So we're beyond just infrastructure. We've got to think about what are all of the components that can go into that platform uh, as part of, of that engineering process. So things like developer tools, workflow, CI, CD. Uh, how do you deal with data and the database platforms that you're using? Analytics. Uh, and how, what, what are the APIs that you're using to actually control and manage that footprint? So we think about it, we're sort of in this cloud 3.0 era, the, where the first variant was about infrastructure and it was about cost. That was the big differentiator. How do we move faster with, with uh, time to market? And now with this platform world, we're thinking, how do we actually innovate and build different technologies, different products? Uh, how do we approach business models in a new way? So we think about it, sort of one third of the top 20 com uh, companies in every industry will be disrupted over the next three years. And we've seen that uh, over the past five years in the private markets with companies like Uber and Airbnb. Uh, and this, this pattern, this trend is continuing. Uh, Mark Collier likes to say software is eating the world. And the reality is a lot of these, these legacy uh, organizations, their, their business models can be replicated and improved upon uh, in software without having to actually own physical infrastructure. And so the, these new companies, they're disruptor. They're disrupting the industries. And they're, they're solving problems that the old companies didn't necessarily think about or, or experience. And they're doing that on new platforms. And so at IBM this week, we, we've brought together all of our offerings under the IBM Blue Mix brand. And so we believe that IBM Bluemix is the platform that, that enterprise developers will use uh, for this, these next generation applications. Bluemix is the most advanced cloud platform that brings together that service catalog, things like Watson uh, and API Explorer, the infrastructure like Bluemix Bare Metal, uh, and all your data services like uh, Cloudant into one unified platform. I think one of the, the compelling, interesting things about IBM is that if you, look about, if you look at the spectrum of services that we provide, we start with, uh, on the left with bare metal. So with the, the Bluemix bare metal service, you get true bare metal access, which gives you all the performance that you need out of the, the raw machine. As you move up the stack, we have flexibility in our virtual server platforms. We have a, a container platform for that type of development. And then we have a full pass offering in our Cloud Foundry suite. And then lastly, over the last uh, year or so, we've introduced serverless computing with our OpenWhisk Open platform. So regardless of what technology stack you're using, we have the capability in the, in the IBM Bluemix platform to service your needs. But again, it's not just about that infrastructure component. It's about the, the full service stack. And so, at the bottom, we have compute storage network, like every cloud provider does. We have the developer services and containers and Cloud Foundry and event-driven programming models. And then we're really thinking about that complete service catalog. So for example, Watson has 36 APIs that are exposed in the IBM Bluemix portfolio, meaning that ordinary developers or enterprise developers, anybody now has access to that full suite of Watson services without having to buy an incredibly expensive on-premises implementation. And this is fundamentally a big change in, in how IBM has approached uh, the market and how IBM has approached sort of software stacks. And so open technologies are, are a really important part of that. And IBM uh, has been a leader in the open source community for many, many years. 
Obviously, at the base level, OpenStack is incredibly important. The IBM uh, private cloud product line is powered by OpenStack. And, and IBM has been an, a contributor of OpenStack since the inception of the foundation. I think if you look at the last seven releases, we've been a top five contributor. We have over about 180 developers within the IBM organization that, that work on every OpenStack release. And there's more than 500 folks across the entire IBM portfolio that work on our OpenStack-based products. From a containers perspective, we're active contributors to uh, the Docker project uh, and to initiatives like Kubernetes. Uh, Cloud Foundry, we're big supporters of that foundation and involved in the development of that platform. And then OpenWhisk was the serverless platform that, that we developed and open sourced. From an analytics perspective, from Spark to the Open API initiative to the Node organizations, and obviously uh, IBM has had a long uh, history in, in the Java world. So more importantly, I think, if you think about global scale and data sovereignty concerns, that Bluemix platform is available uh, around the globe in a consistent way in 48 different cloud data centers connected by this high-speed private network. So if you have a deployment in Seattle and you have a deployment in uh, Germany, you can have interconnected private access between those two, uh, those two deployments without transiting the public internet. And that's a fundamentally unique uh, component of the IBM offering that, that isn't available in other, other cloud providers. But more importantly, we're not just talking about public cloud when we think about this, this strategy. We recognize that there is a need based on data sovereignty concerns or regulatory requirements to be able to have a platform that can reside in other locations or have a platform that is uh, isolated to a specific uh, user or organization. And so while we certainly have uh, the, the Bluemix public platforms, we have these two other offerings that, that are uh, particularly interesting, and we call them dedicated and local. So dedicated, our dedicated offerings are a single tenant implementation of many of these services that sit in a, uh, in a IBM cloud data center, but they belong and are allocated to a single user, so a single organization. So for example, the uh, IBM Bluemix private cloud offering is a single, te single tenant OpenStack installation that belongs to that one buyer. That one buyer gets full access to an API and an SLA without having to worry about the, the rest of the OpenStack installation. That's dedicated. And then local, the concept here is to take that same service catalog, that same capability, and bring it onto a customer's premise. So how do, we, how do we take a little piece of IBM Cloud and put it in a customer's data center? Well, again, alleviating all the operational concerns and burden that you would traditionally have by running this software on your own. So our goal is to provide back to these organizations that true cloud experience, but in a, a variety of consumption methodologies, whether it be public, dedicated, or local. So with that, I'm going to introduce Asmir, and he'll talk a little bit more about the IBM Bluemix offering, which again is our OpenStack-powered uh, product line. All right. Thanks, Jesse. All right. Thank you. So when, um, when, when I talk to customers and they're looking at private cloud, these are the things that, that come to mind, right? They obviously, uh, they could be coming from a different variety of uh, sources. They could be coming from bare metal. Um, or they could be coming uh, from a highly regulated industry, but sharing the infrastructure with another customer was not an option for them. So that's why really private cloud uh, makes sense for them. Uh, but they're also a team that's focused on the application, right? They're a bunch of developers. Um, they like the public cloud experience, but there's reasons they can't use it. Um, and so, uh, and also they're looking at not just their development environment, CI, CD, but also looking at how they scale out to go to production, right? So all these things around having uh, dedicated resources, being able to uh, triage where, where uh, they need to go focus on versus someone else and a team that they can trust, uh, plus the ability to scale uh, when the time is right is, is are the things that, that I internalize and try to put into the offering um, uh, as, as a, that's based around OpenStack. And so what we've done then is we've tried to deliver OpenStack, but remove the risk related to that. You know, those of you who've been in OpenStack for a while understand the early days, understand how we've grown by leaps and bounds, 
um, but also uh, also understand the the focus of your organization, right? And so what we what we try to do is to sort of focus on the things that we as a team have built over the many years that we've run OpenStack Clouds, and then deliver that in a standardized way to all of our customers, right? I'll give you an example around uh, releases. So we have one release for the you know almost hundred clouds that we support, and when we announce an update we update those clouds within a four week period. So the ability for us to have all the clouds look like, uh, look standard, right? No snowflakes allows us to really provide this really safe environment where there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, there's no guesswork, right? We, everything that we do is times by 100. Right? So we know exactly how each cloud's behaving because there's 99 other clouds that behave the exact same way. So we, we can deliver on performance, we deliver on cost, we deliver an elasticity, right? So we deliver both positive and negative elasticity. So when people need more, more, more capacity, we'll be able to deliver that. And also when people figure out they don't need it anymore, we can also subtract that out. So we give, give it both ways. Private and secure, right? By definition, every single cloud runs its own infrastructure. We don't share anything between two tenants. And so that really helps. And it's 100% open stack, right? We take bits uh, upstream. We're running on Mataka right now. I'll cover that in, in a second. Um, and um, and we, we use Ceph on the back ends. We try to really keep a very open infrastructure to allow people to build their applications. And more importantly, if Blue Box isn't the right answer, they can migrate over. As you saw on the, on the demo today, right? Our goal is to not pull people in. Our goal is to allow people to be portable because we know that we're not the only game in town, right? But the, having portability across the community really, really helps. And as Jesse mentioned, there's two ways for us to deliver this experience. Uh, I'll talk about um, uh, uh, dedicated first. So Blue Box Dedicated runs in the IBM Cloud Data Center. So for customers that no longer have a need for their own data centers, the ones that want to leverage the scale and capacity that IBM provides, uh, dedicated is what they, they, they would choose. The same customer or a different customer may decide that they can't do that, right? They still require on-premise infrastructure. They require their teams to be able to manage some portion of their, of their cloud. That's where local comes in. But in both cases, what we try to do is we try to provide that same consistent experience. We literally have the same bits, um, common services, common operational model. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a, 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 our tool that we use internally called Box Panel. Uh, if you look at box panel, a local cloud and a de dedicated cloud looks the same, right? So we, even our support staff manages these clouds the same way. But having this consist consistency allows you to do a bunch of other things around hybrid cloud, around workload portability, right? A lot of these things really matter when you, when you look at it uh, from a, from a, a, a multi-cloud perspective. So how do we do this, right? So we focus on it all the way from the, the, you know, from the, from the floor of the data center all the way up to the apps, right? So let's start with sort of what, what we take on in the IBM Cloud Data Center. We standardize on the data center, the rack, the PDU, and the network. What that allows you to do is, for me, I can provide a template, and I can deploy that same template, that same cloud, in any IBM Cloud Data Center within three days, right? I know I can, we, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of uh, disk, CPUs, network cards that's available everywhere. And so we have that. So we have customers that have two, three, four different clouds running in four different data centers, and, and we're able to stand them up at, and in the same consistency because of the building blocks that we have. As you go further up the stack, we use, you know, we use Linux for our host OS. Uh, and then we use OpenStack, obviously, for IaaS. And then we leverage whatever you want for automation, uh, data, and apps. So people may bring in their own apps that they built in-house. They may bring in a software partners app. Uh, they may bring an IBM app, right? And we don't really distinguish between them because they're just workloads. And as long as the workloads are either cloud-native or cloud-ready, we're ready to go, right? And, uh, and, and, and we're looking towards extending it out because, as you saw in the, in the demo today, uh, there are workloads that run best on bare metal, right? And OpenStack provides that uh, capability for you to you know, wrap that workload into. And the same thing as you go into um, uh, with, with containers. So if you do double click into that, what we do at the OpenStack layer is we provide a lot of choice but a lot of consistency. So I'll you know, call out a couple of things. So we have four different types of compute nodes. Some compute nodes have more cores. Some compute nodes use SSDs. Some compute nodes use 10 gig versus 1 gig. So we try to balance, take a balance between cost um, uh, and, and portability. But you can use all four nodes in the same cloud. 
right? So we know that customers can't choose just one. They may want to mix and match at different times, and so we allow you to go do that. Same thing with block storage. We have a high-speed SSD-based block storage and one that uses a spinning disk. You can mix them together, and I'll show you how we do that uh, today. Object storage, dedicated controllers. You can bring your own IP address space if you want, right? And, and this, again, we want to provide a lot more flexibility in them. And then in terms of uh, services, we provide the same image repository uh, by default, API compatibility, uh, orchestration, single sign-on with Keystone Federation. Uh, we do live migration. We do upgrades. And so there's a bunch of things that we try to do. And again, all of these things here apply both to local and dedicated, right? whether it runs in your data center or in a software data center. And the way that we build our offering is a scale-out approach. Everything that we do is a scale-out approach. So every compute node can be added. We, we have a, we have a high upper limit, we have a minimum limit, and as you go, you can add one, two, three, four, a dozen. Uh, same thing with our block storage, same thing with object storage. So we, we, we think of it this way, uh, take, take advantage of commodity hardware, take advantage of the elastic uh, software layer that, that um, that uh, OpenStack provides. And, um, and it's been really great. I, we, what we've seen is customers tend to start with one type of architecture, and then depend, and we've seen that grow in different ways. A typical thing, people will start with our base cluster, three nodes, and we run a converged, converged environment, and then, uh, and then we go and, and uh, run through dedicated controllers, add block storage on the back end, uh, connect multiple clouds together. So all those things happen in the course of people using more and more of their cloud. Um, so we right now are running on Mataka. We moved to Mataka, I think, in June of this year. And, um, and uh, what we try to do, as I said, try to keep very close to, to uh, the community. And so we're looking at the, the you know, Newton and the newer releases. Uh, and as we go along, what we do, we get, we get two benefits out of that. One, obviously, stability that's introduced in every single release. And then second would be key functionality that's new that wasn't there in the previous release. So I'm going to focus on a couple of things in Mataka. Um, with, in terms of projects, is what we support today, um, and I want to share with you a little bit of our philosophy on how we we you know figure out which which um, which projects come in. Obviously, the first thing we look at is the super user survey, right? That gives us a pulse into what the community wants, what's being used, and what potentially what the demand is. Uh, and then second is we have our own metrics around stability. We spend a lot of time validating projects. We've had projects that we've been testing for more than six months that we haven't productized that. And the reason we don't productize things is because we maintain a, a, an SLA, a service level agreement. Um, we actually pay customers back and give them a credit if we don't maintain our SLA. So it's very, very important for us to ensure that the cloud is always running. And it starts with you know, how, good, how good is the software that you're introducing in that cloud. So we'll start with, we start with this. We, ex, um, we expect to add more capabilities uh, into, into this as the community hardens um, the, the, the software. So that's, uh, you know, so while we run OpenStack, we try to keep very close to the trunk. Another key element, as I said, is the SLA. Federated to Keystone is something that we've, um, we've recently introduced. So we've always supported Keystone, uh, but uh, a, a majority of our customers run more than one cloud. And, uh, and as you know, if, you run, if you're not using uh, Keystone Federation or some sort of central authentication, there's a lot of overhead related to maintaining um, identity across multiple clouds. And so Fairy Keystone has been a godsend through these customers, whether they're using Keystone to Keystone Federation or using some sort of backend authentication, right? And, and we see this a lot in terms of the management of the credentials. We see this a lot around the transparency uh, or you know, the fact that they don't have to send it to IBM. Um, and also, uh, as we all know, we have realities in terms of having to plug into an existing infrastructure, whether it's local or, or dedicated. So uh, I would say Fairdrive Identity is probably one of the fastest adopting uh, projects that we have uh, at Blue Box. Another thing that we've, we've done is we've introduced um, block storage pools. So as I said earlier, we've got two different kinds of block storage. And, um, and uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a cost differential between them. SSDs tend to be the, the ones that provide you the ultimate performance, but at a higher cost compared to hybrid. Hybrid's based on spinning disk architecture with a thin layer of cache. And um, up until our recent release, people have had to choose one or the other, right? And so, but with the uh, uh, changes in OpenStack, you now can create a volume and you can choose which one of these pools that you want to use, right? So we, customers don't have a choice. They just map the, uh, the application relative to what um, the IOPS requirements are. 
Jesse mentioned that we that SoftLayer has a high-speed network and, and a, a variety of other services that's available. When we think about hybrid cloud, we think about how we can use OpenStack with these services that's, that's there. So I'm going to focus on net, networking and storage in this, in this case. Um, a key, a key, you know, so by default, we install our, our clouds with APIs that are public facing. You can add a VPN connection to there, but you're still going over the public internet. And a lot of customers don't want that. They want a direct connection in. That's what direct link is. There's a, you, can, you can tap into the soft layer network and your access inbound into the soft layer and to the um, uh, blue box clouds are running at 10 gig. Right? Uh, global private networks is another thing that people use. So this is an unmetered network that connects all the soft layer data centers together. Uh, a key use case that people use for these, uh, the private network is to do replication. Right? So you can just imagine you've got data in, in uh, San Jose that you want to send to Frankfurt. You would just use the high-speed private network to sort of send that data there, unmetered. And same thing for bringing your own IP. The reality is that we, you know, we want to use floating IPs and assign whatever it is, but uh, there needs to be some management of them, and you can bring your own uh, IP address pool in to allow you to have uh, your data center extension. Um, storage is another thing that we run into. So we have dedicated storage that is tied to the cloud, but people want to also use you know, public uh, multi-tenant services such as public storage to store their backups, to store their image repository, to, do, to use something, maybe uh, deliver a lower cost in storage. And we allow you to access the, the software uh, services such as their performance and endurance block storage, object storage, their backup services, and really all this ties together because people then can mix and match what they want to do. Or of course, they can also you know, run their own services on, 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 top of, um, on top of their cloud. Switching gears to customers that want to look at a, a local deployment, um, as Jesse mentioned, we've, we've, um, we've rebranded a lot of uh, products under the Blue Mix umbrella. This product used to be called Pure App, and uh, it's now called Blue Mix Local System. What's, what's unique about it, it allows you to converge a variety of different workloads and infrastructure types onto the same hardware uh, type. So you could run a Bluemix PaaS, you could run OpenStack, you can run VMware, all on the same uh, bare metal. You can switch the allocation of resources back and forth. And so this gives you, you know, for a lot of people, this gives you the pragmatic approach on how you would, okay, how do I m deploy my cloud native app versus my cloud ready app versus I just want you know, a PaaS or I want an IaaS. Uh, it gives you the flexibility to sort of flip and uh, f uh, switch between those, th those different requirements within the same box. So uh, really flexible, a lot of software that uh, just allows you to sort of think about the, the uh, upper end of, uh, of the stack as opposed to the infrastructure of managing the different components within the stack. But technology really isn't the, 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 winning, uh, uh, the winning recipe for cloud. What we found, and we found this, you know, uh, as some of you may know, Blue Box was an independent company before we got acquired by IBM. But what we found in those early days is that we would stand up the cloud in three days. And then we would hand it over to the customer. And we'd check back in two weeks later. There would be no workloads on the cloud because they didn't know how to use it. They didn't know how to use Horizon. They didn't understand the concepts. So we actually provide a lot of onboarding um, support within the first 30 days uh, and really try to get the customer to use, right? Our, our, you know, while we pride ourselves in being able to bring up a cloud in record time anywhere in the world, it's also about usage of the cloud. And so we spend a lot of time educating people on different concepts. Um, uh, we provide uh, documentation and, and videos to get them going and really check in with them over this you know, uh, month to six week period. Uh, really been, you know, I, I would say, a differentiator in terms of uh, uh, what, what we do. Uh, and then around support and upgrades. So a lot of our customers tend to want to stay close to OpenStack. And we, we have a quarterly release cycle. And so uh, we, and we try to add functionality at every release. And so that's important. But we do that. We, what we do literally is ask for a, a window to do your uh, upgrades. Generally, we've seen, depending on the size of the cloud, your upgrades, we can do an upgrade in between 90 minutes to uh, three hours. And that's, that's it. You know, that's the downtime, and you'll get your new release, whether it's going from a kilo to Mataka or really going from you know, a maintenance release up. And then we keep a month-to-month -month commit, right? So our, while our customers tend to sign longer contracts because they get a, a volume discount as a result, um, you can cancel after 30 days. 
right? And that, that allows, gives people a lot of flexibility, you know, that experience that they, they see with cloud, and that's something that, you know, just, uh, just very, you know, I think very current with what, how people are thinking in terms of their IT strategy. But it'll fail if there's no understanding with the customer. And so we, we spend a lot of time talking to customers, not only to educate them, but also to find that uh, line between where the, what they want to own and what we should own. And this is generally how it's playing out, right? We tend to focus on the hypervisor and the physical layer, the, the, bits, the bits that people really not, don't have much interest in. That's really what, not where the innovation is. Um, they don't want to, you know, open stack, maintaining the SLA, technical support, Right, securing the network, so um, you know vulnerability scanning. So those are the things that, that we take on, um, and as I said earlier, we can do it very well because we've got a hundred of, of these clouds under management. For the customer, what they get to focus on is the hypervisor and above, right? The virtual machines, the apps, the licensing, the backup, right? The things that they probably don't want us to touch anyway because it will probably uh, go against uh, their the compliance requirements. Um, and, and really, but also really allows them to focus on the, on the innovation layer at the application and above, right? And so this is generally what, what we do, um, and, um, and it's, it's worked out really, really well in terms of you know, letting people innovate. And the customer in this sense also could be an IBM team that's building on top of, on top of a blue box. So if you saw in the demo today, you know, if you're paying attention on the IBM part, that, was, that demo was being run on, on uh, blue box and also Materna that was also in the, um, in the keynote today, they're, they're delivering uh, software services on top of Blue Box, right? So again, this is generally how we've been putting this into action. Okay, that's great. So what I'm gonna close with are four different use cases that, we've, that I wanna share with you and how people are using Blue Box and how that's transforming um, their business. So the first is a, a, a company that does casual games. Um, and really for them, they were a bunch of developers. They had no interest whatsoever dealing with OpenStack and the infrastructure under OpenStack. And so that's really where we came in. We provided that, you know, the, the uh, setup that was very close to where they were, they were based. They're, they're based in Seattle, um, and, and we stood this up in, in, in San Jose. And then we, they could use the knowledge that we had in OpenStack to go get, get this done. And so they got their OpenStack cloud. Uh, they moved off of their commercial offering that they had been running in-house and they could, they could scale out geographically, right, because we could provide that same template of their cloud in many different places. A second customer was a company, a customer that ran concerts. And so they would do, you know, as concerts, you can say there's a lot of build up to the concert, there's a lot of um, changes, and, you know, and the entire industry is changing where there's a lot more engagement with mobile devices and whatnot. And so they were, they were focused on SaaS as their offering which again required them not to focus too much on, on the infrastructure. This is where we came in again. We could spin up clusters quickly as they were thinking about doing music festivals in different parts of the world. Uh, we were able to support them and they could deliver their, their, their experience that they want uh, globally. Um, the next customer was um, a company that was helping students enter the job market, right? You know, those of you who have who were there uh, recently or have um, uh, young ones that are entering the job market. This is really you know, a very confusing time for them. And what this company was doing was to, was to really try to provide that guidance. But their challenge was they, were, you know, they just couldn't provide the service, right? The infrastructure was not stable and, and they really needed something that was there so they could focus on the offering itself. Again, we came in, we focused on the things, hypervisor and below allowed them to go rapidly uh, deploy and really focus the IT team you know, on, on the business. Um, and again, and as, you, as you can see over and over again, it's about, it's not about technology, but it's about the business and the business value that we're providing. And what we're trying to do is to really simplify, remove the fiction uh, that exists in, 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 in this new cloud world where the, you know, the oily bits there may not, may not be of interest to the, uh, to the customer. And the final uh, customer I want to show is CloudSoft, and they're, they're an ISV, so they're, if you will, the opposite of the, th the first three. Their business is technology, um, and, uh, but they wanted to build their offering on an open platform. Uh, they had doubled down on it, 
and um, and they were also doing a lot of um, a lot of um, uh, proof of concepts around the world. So they have multiple clouds in three different uh, geographies. We connect them using the um, the private network. We do they do a lot of replication on that on that backbone. Um, and um, and really, I think for them is just making sure that when they need to go engage with a customer and do and do demos and whatnot, that the infrastructure is there. And so that's what we've been doing. Um, we have a lot of um, a, a lot of content on their use case and their and their success criteria. Um, if you go to the IBM website, you'll be able to see a lot of uh, info on on CloudSoft and their and their use case. All right, so. So in summary, what we're seeing with IBM is really around you know, the, these things here. Choice and control, I think, is probably one of the key, key reasons why people come to IBM. As Jesse mentioned earlier, the th different delivery models really helps people not lock themselves in. We focus a lot of our time on operational excellence, uh, focus on the SLA, and, and uh, we've got skin in the game, right? We, we actually give you credits if the SLA is not met. And we make it predictable, right? We have a, we have a, a, a quarterly release cycle. Uh, we try to keep our upgrades within a certain window. Um, our engagement is predominantly via chat and, and email, so just very simple and, and, and um, uh, for us to for you to get to us. And we try to keep our cloud standard, right? And that really helps us run the business and it helps us scale the business. Well, with that, I uh, thank you for uh, spending time with us today. I think that we are we'll start back up again after lunch. There'll, there'll be um, customer case studies coming in. So if you have any questions, um, come on up and I'll answer them. Otherwise, have a good um, summit. Thank you very much.